years. Um, so there, were no, there was no reason to actually divert from uh, what we all perceive to be a standard, which is just, okay, let's use the U image of U-boot and flash it into the flash memory. And we were not facing any, um, any difficulties with that. But now um, there are no hard constraints if we have larger storage like NAND, which led to an increasing amount of uh, wild growth of uh, vendor solutions. And nobody really has an interest in solving that or creating a, a standard because there's no really relevant sales arguments uh, for that in, in the industry. Like, why should we care about storage if we do networking devices, obviously? Also, the topic is not of any academic interest, at least not anymore in the last 10 years. Um, these things have been mapped out and you can't write a PhD about it. So this is also a reason why um, there's little to no discussion about it. In a way, it's all uh, trivial to get right, but yet uh, people and vendors do get it wrong all the time and then later on we'll have to fix it up and that, that's causing a lot of pain. So in the good old days, as I said, we had very small um, flash memory, NOR flash, which was connected via SPI or memory mapped. Um, it was small and slow, but it was also reliable. And basically, we could just use a partitioning scheme in which the bootloader, the bootloader environment, the kernel, the root file system, and the overlay um, were just living peacefully in their, inside their partitions. There, were no, there was no need for special encodings or anything special to take care of. A simple checksum in the image um, was enough and that was provided by U-Boot, so there just wasn't much room for a discussion. So this is no longer true or increasingly starts to be no longer true for modern devices which come with larger storage like NAND or eMMC, but that's on another page. Um, I'm going to talk about directly connected NAND flash now because this is fast and big, but also inherently unreliable. Um, NAND flash has a, a, a limited number of uh, write, but sometimes even read cycles. It can survive on the same page. So we need to do all kinds of special games. So imagine the SOC now coming up and wanting to boot. So usually the bootloader is also itself stored inside the NAND flash. So in order for that to be reliable, um, the SOC vendors um, just use very simple forward error correction codes like a Hamming code, which basically means that the amount of space needed for U-boot, it's just times eight or something because you're just using a byte to store a single bit. But that's reliable enough to make sure that the device won't break during its supposed lifetime. Um, and that's not so problematic. Um, however, the bootloader then needs to read at least the kernel and its partition somehow from the NAND flash. And um, th that's been solved very differently. Some vendors basically just put the plain U image inside the NAND and hope that there are no bad blocks whatsoever. And um, that's all right if you don't update the device too many times and won't exhaust the um, write cycles. Um, the, all the rest is then being dealt with um, by the Linux kernel and this is also um, ranging from obscure things like uh, modifications of uh, JFFS2 which has been made fit for NAND or um, YAFFS which is a special na uh, flash file system which can also handle NAND flashes. And in the last year increasingly UBFS has fortunately been used because it provides a upstream and good solution for the problem. However, also that you can use differently. Um, this is a slide I took from the UBI um, presentation. It's very beautiful and this presentation is made very well. So if any of you doesn't know what UBI or the whole UBI layer is, you should watch those slides because they're all, you know, they're really well done. You should enjoy those slides URLs down there. I'm not going to reintroduce all the way UBI works. So how does booting work? Oh, this slide apparently kind of got wrong, at least the font. Um, so the in-sock bootloader, like the sock has a little SROM with the in-sock loader, 
which can load from different storage types, like the same SOC could have SPI flash or NAND flash or even MMC. And through some external pins of the SOC, usually it's decided from which device it's actually loading the bootloader. I'm going through this in this sequential order because this sequential boot order basically determines what needs to be in the flash and in which order and where you can have variations. So just so un you understand why do I now t suddenly talk about booting. Um, as I said before, the bootloader is usually stored or has to be stored in a uh, SOC specific encoding, which is usually very trivial. And then uBoot itself comes up and needs to read maybe its environment if it does have an environment and the kernel, and then it just launches the kernel. Um, so the question is how does it do that? So we are, we are on NAND flash. Oh no, that was supposed to be an animation. That's sad, it's also missing. Um, that was the DOS game Perestroika from 1990 because that very much resembles the game you have to play when you want to survive on NAND flash. It's a pity it's missing, but you can just look at it on archive.org. So NAND suffers to different degrees from data rot. That means on very cheap NAND, which fortunately I haven't ever encountered in networking devices, you might have as little as only a thousand of write cycles before the block um, no longer gives you the guarantee of being readable afterwards. Some of the NAND chips do have guarantees for the first few megabytes, which should be more reliable supposedly than the rest of it. Um, Mostly what we see today in NAND-based routers that we have um, MLC means multi-layer cell, SLC means single-layer cell, so single-layer cells have uh, much um, lesser density and are thus more expensive, uh, but also more reliable. So there you can have 10,000s of write cycles, which is not that problematic, obviously, but still you can have random bad blocks even occurring before that, and you need to take care of them, otherwise the device will be bricked. So um, the bootloader is stored in a very extensive way, and basically UBI can do the remaining job. So where is the problem, you might ask? And the problem comes from here. Now we discussed the device is going to boot, and loading the bootloader, and then the bootloader, you know, loads everything it wants from UBI. So that would be ideal because then we dealt with those um, unfortunate properties of the NAND flash by extensively storing the bootloader in some Hemming code, and then UBI does all the ver leveling magic to save us from this rotting environment, and we somehow gonna survive. However, um, we need to look closely there because um, mind the gap, there's something hiding there. Sometimes you find things there and that's problematic to different degrees. The bootloader itself for many reasons might not support UBI, which is also because many SOC vendors unfortunately gave the bootloader a size limitation. I've often seen that they say, okay, good, we store it in some kind of forward error correction, which means that we use a byte for a bit, and then we still limit the whole thing to two megabytes, which means effectively U-boot cannot be larger than 256 kilobytes on many modern SOCs, which means that you have to decide either you want modern image support or you want UBI, but certainly you're not going to have any file system support in those 256 megabytes, which is a bit problematic, but I hope that more modern chips will just have larger size limits. So for the bootloader environment, ideally that's not very problematic because you will hopefully ne not write it too many times. Later on we will see examples that that's unfortunately also not always true. However, the kernel it's more problematic because we are writing it at least on every upgrade on the device. And if it's a fixed hard-coded location in the flash, then a single bad block in this, look, in this area will, make, will render the device unusable and that will be problematic. Then there's also the EEPROM, I mean the Wi-Fi calibration data. That's not that problematic, um, at least not on SLC NANs, because we're only writing it once in factory and then we're never, never, ever writing to it again. And reading doesn't destroy at least SLC NANs. MLC NANs, however, can also be exhausted by just reading from them, but we won't get there, hopefully. So in order to make that as nice as it could possibly get, U-Boot um, itself does have support for UBI, which is redundant with the support in the Linux kernel. It's basically just copy-pasted from there and kept in sync more or less with the Linux kernel sources. 
and it not only supports loading images from UBI, either from, I'm saying from UBI, and I mean UBI, not UBIFS. UBIFS is a file system on top of UBI, which could also be used for that, but mostly it makes sense to just load the kernel directly from a UBI volume, which is just a raw volume, which appears to be the same as an MTD device, just that you have all this var leveling magic and error correction underneath. So, um, but it also supports storing the bootloader environment, which is like the boot configuration uh, inside um, UBI, even redundantly, which also makes a lot of sense if you're writing to it more than once, which we will get to later. Uh, boot images uh, could be um, modern uh, uh, flattened image tree, like fit images, or um, could be traditional legacy um, U image that could also be stored in UBI. So it makes a lot of sense to use it because in that way you're preventing the devices from being bricked by just a single bat block appearing. And even if the NAND flashes do have these guarantees that the first few megabytes probably won't deteriorate as fast as the rest of it, um, the kernel and root file system often exceeds that um, area with those special guarantees by magnitude, so um, we should really use UBI to store those megabytes of images. Like these guarantees are meant for the bootloader only, apparently so. Um, also use plain UBI volumes to store the kernel, which is then loaded from the um, flash, in order to avoid the unnecessary complexity of a whole file system and also the terrible amount of errors which would come in when we're using a file system in that place. A plain volume with a static size uh, is totally enough for that, so maybe we should really do that. So um, a short introduction in OpenWT slash lead, we had a new image building templates uh, being introduced uh, recently or more or less recently within the last year. Um, they replace a lot of messy platform specific code which we previously used to generate factory images and also to subgrade images um, and they also ease the support for more complex uh, storage devices like I said NAND flash or EMMC or even imagine on x86 you might have just a regular hard drive and grub starting there. So previously this used to be a pain to, to generate. We had like tons of uh, platform specific make file magic to do it and now we have a very beautiful pipeline based syntax where you could just say okay I need the kernel and I need it to be LZMA compressed and then I need this to be inside a U image of LZMA compression, like that's just a type to be appear, to appear in the header of the U image. And in this way um, you could replace a previous, previously exhaustive uh, platform specific code with just a single line. And the advantage of the new image building template apart from that is also that you have all device specific information in a single location. Previously we used to have profiles and we had the image make file and then um, we had a lot of user space probing, translating the one name into the other name and all this is now being massively simplified. So the name you see in make menu config is the same name as the, for example, device tree source of that device is the same name as the image file name. This is all now in a single place which just is much more convenient. And also just recently um, per device root file system generation is possible and even in parallel during the build which is great for release builds um, because then each device image really just comes with the packages selected for that specific device, let's say different Wi-Fi drivers and such. So um, these are the parameters to, to generate UBI uh, images. Um, these are hardware specific um, things of the NAND flash and then most importantly you can tell the image uh, generation template whether the kernel could be stored in UBI or even the UBIT environment should be created as an empty block inside the factory image. Um, this obviously the first two, they need support by the bootloader in order to make sense but hopefully that will more and more grow. So. Um, Factory images, uh, when I mean a factory image, that's a, an image which can be stored on the raw flash device without being formatted using special tools. So this is commonly used because um, flash chips become 
get, get pre-flashed in the factory before actually being soldiered on the board. So they have machines which don't necessarily know anything about the Linux kernel or UBI or anything like that. So we just need a raw file to be flashed on it and we can generate that uh, which is called a UBNized image because it already contains all the UBI magic to some degree and later on is fixed by the, uh, by the first boot. So we thought that that would be enough because all those features are there in the kernel. It contains um, a free space fix up also which should do, but I will get to that later, what we then needed as another patch. Also there's an auto resize which basically says that the last volume, um, which is usually the rootfs overlay, should just take all the remaining space, which is similar to what we do with JFFS2 on NORFLASH. And this is integrated in uh, OpenWRT's configuration, so you can just set that you need that for that target, and then it's going to be done. Unfortunately, um, this turned out to be not really enough, um, because also not only on a file system level, but on a logical on a logical block and physical block level the, re, the remaining device still needs to be formatted it's it hasn't been ubi formatted yet every block needs its logical block id which is written in the beginning of the block in each and every nand block by ubi so this also needs to be done on the first boot it's kind of similar to the jfs uh, jffs2 fix up um, but on mtd block level even though we are in ubi so there was a patch suggested for that which recently caused some fallout because it wasn't suitable for, for upstreaming and it apparently changes the on-flash format of UBI which annoyed some people. So I hope that there will be more discussion which might still fit after that talk um, to get that upstream or at least to get it discussed with the people involved. Um, so we have a bunch of more kernel hacks which then also came into the um, attention um, of the kernel maintainers um, because what we do on OpenWT lead and what we always used to do is that we start the kernel and then the kernel figures out which root file system, where to mount the root file system from. And unfortunately we cannot rely in the existing bootloader which we try not to replace because that would be dangerous. Um, to give us the right information for that. So on other Linux systems you might say, okay, you just have some kernel command line parameters which are being passed over to you. However, the flash layout chosen by the vendor might not be the same. So the numbering of the partitions or even the file system types might not be the same on OpenWRT. So those parameters, even in the good old days, we just threw them away and used built-in parameters for each device. Device tree allows to do that nicely. You can just say append, append the kernel command line um, with that and then we have a patch to just drop the bootloader command line completely because that would mess things up for us. So then the next thing comes that we need to probe mount um, a UBI, sorry, I wrote UBIFS, I see now I meant UBI volume, which it's just a naming convention, similar as we did on, on NORFLASH, it has to be called rootfs and then we try to mount it. But similar to how it is on NORFLASH, there might be different file systems. We might have a read-write file system containing the whole root file system already, which is sometimes good during development if we really want to replace stuff or if we want to have kind of a rolling release update style to replace things. But during production, it turns turns out, and also on most commercial devices, that we do have a read-only file system and then an overlay volume on top. In that case, in that UBI volume, you would find a SquashFS. Um, so we created some root dev hacks, um, which are probing hacks in the kernel to basically figure out the file system type and according to that mount either the UBI device, which is only suitable for UBIFS, or mount or create and mount a UB block device so SquashFS could be mounted. This allows us to not boot with an init RAMFS which we're using for other development purposes and that would also be a little bit clashy but we might discuss that also later the, after the talk. So after the kernel has booted we have the early runtime coming up. It mounts an overlay file system on, on top of SquashFS in case we are having a read-only um, root file system. 
and we have support for extrude. Extrude is an open WRT thing and to have an external block device like a USB pen drive to be your root file system after boot, um, which is useful mostly for devices with smaller flashes, but it makes also sense for some UBI devices if there's just like 32 megs of flash, which is on some devices. And we can mount additional custom user UBFS uh, volumes, maybe for databases or log files or whatever, which shouldn't fill up our um, root file system or config overlay. So um, the user space tools were extended for that, like our file system tool library and the block tool. Uh, John Crispin has done a lot of work to improve it and support a new sys upgrade format so we can flash uh, devices on the running system and just by one reboot replace the kernel and the root file system. And um, I wrote a patch for uh, U-Boot Env tools, which is basically the firmware print env, firmware set env, user space tool to also allow modifying and reading the UBI backed um, uh, environment. The problems we are facing is basically we have to replace non-UBI stock firmware because the stock firmware might use JA FFS or something like that and vendors use outdated versions of U-Boot uh, which don't have UBI support and then we are really doomed. Um, and also because of the big flash now we have a great variety of dual booting or recovery things and that's great because it makes the devices more reliable. However, if every vendor creates its own solution then um, we have a wild growth of things we need to support later on. Just briefly, the best practice, what I presume would be to really close the gap. Use UBI for everything except for the bootloader itself whenever you can. Avoid unnecessary writes, especially things such as boot counters being stored in the U-boot environment. You will laugh, these are things I've actually seen in commercial systems. Um, to have a dual booting option or to just write the environment on every boot and then obviously after two years with a daily reboot, you will have killed the NAND. Um, it would be great to transparently implement dual boot or recovery features using U-Boot scripting, which is possible, and try to please keep it simple. Um, in order to make it better, we will have to do some improvements to um, U-Boot. And um, it would be great to have a generic boot manager to handle those rescue and recovery and fallback things, because I think none of the vendors is really proud of their own solutions. And if it was just part of U-Boot, they would all use it and we wouldn't have those problems. Now, um, the kernel hacks we have, um, the auto-attach hacks and probing the root file system hacks, they work great for us. However, they're not suitable for, for upstream and the Linux MTD community, uh, for understandable reasons, they don't want to create more probe hacks in the kernel which are needed for that and they suggested us to use an init RMFS for us which is a lot of complexity we do want to avoid so obviously there has to be some more discussion how do we want to solve that in future if it's supposed to go into the kernel. The same for um, user land, some things have to be improved and we already discussed a bit about it, how that could be done. Yeah, um, that's already the end of the talk. I hope we still have one minute for discussions and questions. And I want to say big thanks to Eric Schulz and the Purple Foundation um, for inviting me to um, hold this talk. It would not have been possible without them. Also, thanks for all the debate and reviewing. I think this is criticizing each other and reading each other's patches is the great thing of our community because in this way we all learn a lot, especially John and Hauke of the LEAD project have been helping a lot and Richard Weinberger of Linux MTD has reviewed all my patches and uh, turned them down, but yet we, we are, I've learned a lot and <laughs> I'm, I'm very thankful for those reviews. Also, Ralf Senhauser and Kenneth Johansen have sent patches for various devices um, to improve the current situation. And I'm really hoping for some kind of round table to figure out how to solve this uh, boring topic in a way that it doesn't create a lot of unnecessary complexity. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's discuss things and um, maybe now, maybe later in the social time or tomorrow. <laughs> um, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, is this everything about uh, So, uh, 
is this about uh, NAND over uh, NAND controller? Uh, if I have SPI NAND, which uh, nowadays it's become more and more uh, popular, um, of course, then always I need a little SPI NOR flash, but the rest, I mean kernel and uh, root FS, uh, I put in SPI NAND. Uh, how was uh, how would uh, impact your uh, whole uh, <laughs> discussion here? Is it uh, much easier to to do? Uh, I, I th it m it mostly depends on how well um, SPI NAND is already supported by uh, U-Boot. In theory, I think it's even thinkable that the in-SOC SROM loader of the SOC could support loading the bootloader from SPI NAND. Generally speaking, UBI and the wear leveling magic and error correction magic is independent of the storage type. Whatever becomes a, an MTD device under Linux, you could put UBI on top and use it and just leverage the support things we got. Um, I haven't ever touched a device which comes with SPI NAND yet, but I'm aware that uh, this is coming and I'm looking forward to see the first boards and we will see how we live with them. I can provide you such a board. <laughs> great, great. I'm looking forward to see it. <laughs> okay. No other questions? In that case, we have a short break of a few minutes and then thank you very much. Thank you.